My name is Vicki, and I'm a member here at Desert Grace Community Church. We have a great message for you today, and if you've enjoyed this video, be sure to give us a thumbs up and leave a comment so we can know you've been blessed. Have a good day. Good morning, everyone. I don't look much like Pastor. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Thank you. So you look at this glass of water here. I forgot I'm in charge of switching my own. Let me try that. How heavy do you think this glass of water is? 16 ounces? 12 ounces? Well, I'm here to tell you The weight of the glass of water doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It depends on how long I'm going to hold it. If I hold on to it for a minute, nothing happens. If I hold on to it for an hour, my arm will begin to ache. If I hold on to it for a day, a whole day, it's going to do more than ache, isn't it? My arm will become numb and it will be paralyzed. The longer I hold on to it, the heavier it seems to be. Agree with that? If I think about the stresses a little in my life, nothing really happens. If I think, that I, I, if I think about the stresses in life a little longer, what happens? My heart will begin to hurt. If I think about the stresses in my life all day long. I will become numb and paralyzed. Cast all of your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Cast all of your anxieties. We were not we were not built to carry stress. Cast all of your anxieties. Tim and I, as you know, we got married 8898. That happens to be my mother's birthday. That happens to be pastor's birthday. Tim was 36 and I was 32. A little old for getting married, but hey, 36 and 32. And you know, we were very excited. We were ready to start a family. 36 and 32 because of that, what is that, the AMA, the average maternal age, advanced, advanced maternal age. And all of our doctors were telling us, uh, Tawny, you're on that advanced maternal age. But we couldn't start right away. We had some things we needed to take care of. When I was a child, about 12 years old, I had a, a disease called endometriosis which developed all kinds of cysts on my ovaries. And at 12, I had one and a half of my ovaries taken out. Left me with a half of an ovary. Doctor says, mm, I'm sorry to tell you this, I may have been a little bit presumptuous and a little quick to cut. And my mother was like, what? But it was done and we couldn't go back. So I started thinking about it after Tim and I got married and I, and I was picking up my glass of water and I was carrying it around with me. Oh, I remember those days. And it kept coming back. Cast your anxiety, cast your cares upon me and I will give you rest. So during the first couple years Tim and I were married, um, I had a couple surgeries. They had to clean out a bunch of uh, scar tissue. Uh, I had a few more cysts they had to take off. Um, 
So it took about two years. And then they put me on a drug called Clomid. And if you know anything about Clomid, Clomid is a fertility drug that produces um, um, eggs. So we, we tried that, very hopeful, very excited. Tim was always ready to, to try again. God bless my husband, he's a good boy. <laughs> so through that process, you know, we'd rush home and we'd think, okay, I'm ovulating, Tim, get home, it's time. And then, you know, standing on your head and all those kinds of things, oh my goodness, it was quite the circus at our house for the first couple years. Came into our second couple of years. Um, and I kept continuously picking up my glass of water, packing it around, putting it back down because that still small voice kept telling me, cast your fear upon me and I will give you rest. Stop trying to figure this out, Tawny. Year three, we thought, well, maybe this isn't going to happen. So maybe God has a different plan for us. So we started going to adoption meetings here in, U in Yuma, um, talking about adoption, about the possibilities of, of, of uh, adopting a, a, a child or a teenager, or we were so open, we were just, we were just uh, in, a, in a good mindset. We were so excited until our class instructor told us and this is verbatim. They said, don't get too excited. Your job as a foster parent is to care for the child until the birth parents are ready to receive their child back. <sighs> Picked it up again. Walked around. I was so disheartened. Because to give a child back, I didn't want to sign up for that. I wanted, I wanted the child, I wanted to love, I wanted to, I wanted, I wanted, I wanted. So I began to feel paralyzed and capable of doing anything. This affected my job. Um, I was a principal at the time, um, and this was a long time ago. And I decided, well, maybe, maybe I should go back to teaching. I'll go back to teaching, less stress, less stress, and maybe... We can do what Dr. Vining told us to do. Well, he didn't tell me to cast, but God did. He said, cast all of your anxiety on him. That verse just kept coming back and coming back and coming back. And so year four, Dr. Vining, which is my gynecologist here, he's since retired. What a wonderful man. He says, well, let, why don't we try in vitro fertilization, better known as IVF. And if you don't know anything about IVF, it's a test tube, baby. And I remember back in 1983, I was in high school reading the Enquirer magazine. Yes, my mother did not miss a week. We, and I saw on the front, it was test two baby. And I was like, oh, that's so hocus pocus. That's, got, that's not real. It is real. It was real. And that was back in 1983. So <clears throat> they put me on some medication. Um, the doctor that he provided... Uh, suggested to me was in Tucson. So Tim and I went back and forth to Tucson, and they put me on a drug called Perganol. If you know anything about Perganol, it's, it massively increases egg production. Women usually produce one egg a month. Perganol, you can have 40, 50 eggs in one cycle. So it was, it was crazy. It was absolutely crazy. So after you're on the Perganol, then you go back to the doctor, and he successfully takes a, a, a um, syringe and sucks out all of those embryos, or excuse me, eggs. He collects the eggs from your, your ovaries. And here, Tim's job was easy again. They were fertilized in the lab. And then about five days later, depending on how many eggs they, they take out, they freeze a majority of them and then they put in how many, however many you desired. Today they don't do that so much because we were putting 10, 14, 15 at a time. And the doctor always says, well, you know you're going to have to do a, um, I forget what they call it, where you terminate some of them if they all take. And Tim and I didn't care. We were, we were hey, there can be octomom, there can be 14 a mom, whatever. We were prepared to do whatever, whatever we needed to do. 
When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. God had given me a new, a new verse. I was still casting my fears. I was still picking up the water, but then I put it back down, picking it up, putting it back down. Um, but we, it was a long journey. We started this process back in 2002. We implanted 10. We implanted 14. And as you can see, we implanted and planted and planted. God had blessed us financially, and we were able to do this. But in 2008, our daughter Emma was born. She was, yes, Emma. Uh, she was embryo number 73. And um, in 2011, in May, Madison was born. Uh, and she was embryo number 91. Embryo 91. There's some pictures of, of this amazing, amazing miracle in our life. Embryo 91. 91 embryos. Embryos. People. Children. Every single one of them. Tim and I named because they are in heaven today Amen. all 91 of them and what an amazing amazing homecoming their sacrifice will never be un I'll never forget but 91 of them 91 So, 91 embryos. Later, we have two beautiful daughters. Took over 10 years. Remember that maternal, what is that, advanced maternal age? I'd have people, nurses coming in and, and just looking at me. You know, I was about ready to give birth and I was just like, by that time, you know, your hormones are all over the place and you're saying, what, what? Oh man, we have never seen this old of a parent before. We just wanted to see what one looked like. So I was 45 when I had Emma. I was 49 when I had Madison. And I wanted to say, you know, this is nothing. Sarah was 90. You know, 90. So always remember, first of all, cast your cares on him and he will give you rest and put down your glass of water. It doesn't do anything for you. God is the only thing that does. So praise team, please come up. Good morning. Happy Mother's Day out there to all the beautiful women. I need my, my Desert Grace kits. Woohoo! Thank you. All right. Okay. Oh, ha ha. In my bag of tricks, I have, let me show you. I have, all right, so let me get it out. It's in here somewhere. Here it is. I have an awesome bowl. Tap it. Tap it. Tap it. It's a good bowl, it is about the right size for just about everything. There's slosh room for soup. It can pop some uh, ice cream in here with hot fudge, popcorn. This is a good bowl. However, if you take this bowl and you hit it with a hammer, what do you think is going to happen, ladies and gentlemen? Right? This makes me nervous, too. This bowl is awesome. I would say it's pretty close to perfect. But if you hit it with this hammer, it is going to break. You guys ready? I don't like doing this either. All right. Here it goes. Three. Uh-oh. Be careful, because now some of the pieces are falling out. 
which is what I was trying not to do. All right, everyone take a peek in the bag. Careful, careful. What happened to that glass bowl? It's, don't, don't touch. I want you to get cut. It's broken. My perfect bowl shattered. Do you guys know that there is this type of artwork in Japan where they take shattered bowls and they put it back together? And it turns it into a bowl that's even more beautiful, even more perfect than when it started. It's called, I don't speak Japanese, I don't want to trash it. So that's what it's called. <laughs> yeah, I don't even, I'm not even going to try it. I don't speak Japanese, that's what it's called. And they make these beautiful, beautiful works of art. And it can come out something like this. Isn't that pretty? Now, what if we were to think of this beautiful bowl that we started with as a person? And enter sin, the hammer. If you think of the hammer as sin, it breaks you. It destroys you. You're useless. But however, if you accept Christ, my, if you accept Christ, you are Therefore, a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come, and you get to be this very pretty, pretty, pretty bowl that has been repaired, fixed, put back together. Amen? Amen? Here. All right. Can my littles go sit down? Thank you. I get to share some stuff with the grown ups now. So, Pastor asked, for us to kind of give our testimony about what it means to be a mother. I was that broken bull. Very much so. Um, as a child, I had the faith of a child. I believed in Jesus. I believed in heaven. But we as a family didn't go to church. So I didn't grow in that faith. And when someone else's brokenness, someone else's sin entered my life, I didn't understand God and what he could and would do with those circumstances. And I became very, very angry and set about showing God just how angry I was. And in that anger, I sinned. Things I don't normally talk about that if you don't know me, you may not even be aware of, because I'm not that person anymore. I am a brand new creation. And it's one of the reasons why I am so amazingly grateful for the life that I have been given, because I gave up that right with my actions. I, I ended a child. I placed a child up for adoption. To me, now, I don't deserve to get to have these four beautiful children in my house who call me mother. I don't deserve this. I don't deserve to get to step out on a Saturday in Upward Sports and have all those children run to come play a game and learn a little bit more about Christ. I gave that up. I definitely don't deserve to be part of these beautiful children's lives who I'm part of now but because our God is so amazing and so loving that he sent our Savior, and through him we become that new creation. The old is gone, it's forgotten. But he's not done. That's not enough for our God, because he is bigger and more amazing than you can wrap your minds around. It's not enough just to be like, okay, it's forgiven, it's forgotten. He then takes those very broken pieces, those ugliness where brokenness and sin has changed your life forever. And he puts it back together. And he makes it even more beautiful than when it started. And he takes that brokenness, and when he puts it back together again, he then places in your heart a calling, something that is overwhelming to you. For me, that calling, I don't ever want any of these children to come upon a storm 
to be broken, to be hurt, and walk away from God. We all know the storms are going to come, right? I mean, they're going to happen. Life is hard. No one gets out of this unscathed. But what happens in their lives, when they are faced with the unthinkable, I want these children to stand there, feet firmly rooted in Christ, and go, my father holds me in his hand, and I'm not scared. I'm not going to look away. I want them to be like Christ taking a nap in that boat because they know who holds them in their hands. That's my calling. That's where I have been repaired, where my passion comes from. No one in this room is sitting here perfect. Every one of us has been broken somewhere by sin. What is God doing to mend you back? What is your passion? Where are you being called to serve? Because all things work for the glory of God for those who love him. Amen? Amen. Thank you. Oh, Tawny, thank you so much. Vicki, thank you. Thank you. I grew up as a foster child, lived in three different foster homes, and so I had a number of women in my life that had the name, the label, mom or mother or stepmom or gram or mama or mother-in-law, and you know, I could go on and on and on. I was, I remember, I remember one year going to the store to buy Mother's Day cards. And at that point in my life, I had two foster mothers that I was in contact with that needed a card from me. I had a gram that needed a card. I had a mother-in-law that also needed one. And I had a bio mom that said I needed to send her one. I don't know that she needed one, but I needed to send it to her. I was placed in the uh, first foster home when I was a baby. Lived there for until I was 10. The foster father was ill and couldn't, um, I couldn't live there any longer, so I was placed in a second home. That home was actually related to the first one and actually had siblings. So I had two sisters that were close to my age. That's, that's a kind of a good thing, right? That's kind of a good thing. It's also a challenging thing because the one, the one daughter, which happened to be their daughter, was two months older than me. And I was sure she was loved more than me. Now the next one was a year younger than me and we were loved about the same. So I was kind of okay with that, but I was always jealous of that first one. And we did not get along as siblings at all. The, uh, the other daughter was um, a few years younger than me and then the little boy was just uh, newborn. And I, wasn't a very nice daughter. You know, when you're jealous of someone, when you don't think that somebody loves you, you react. And you react like, you react out of not feeling loved, even though they tried their best to love me. I can, as an adult, I can look back and I can see that they did. But at that time, I didn't feel like I was loved. And so I reacted, and I particularly reacted to the mom. In fact, so much so that I ran away, left that home, went back to the first foster home. She would love to have had me stay there, but the rules with foster care is you can't, at that time in Oregon, you could not go back to the original home. And so I was placed in a third one, stayed there for about a year, and then moved on to a religious boarding school that didn't work real well either. And I decided that I really wanted a family. It was what my heart longed for, was to be part of a family. So let's go start your own. That's not a wise thing to do, by the way. That is not a wise thing to do. The only good that came out of it was my son. And I look back at his growing up, and I wonder if I was the best mom that he could have had. I'm thankful that I had him. 
I'm thankful that I didn't um, have to give him up, but I don't know that I was really the best. I mean, when you're 17, 18 years old, that's a tough time to be a mama because you're still a kid yourself. And during this time, you know, you know God, God works in the most amazing ways in our life. Every one of you would be able to tell a story of when you know that God was moving in your life. Didn't recognize it at the time, but you can look back and see that he was drawing. And he put me in contact again with that second foster family. And they took me back as her child. I was probably 18 at the time, so I didn't end up living with them again, but I was every bit a part of their family. You know, the Word of God says that God puts the lonely, he puts the solitary in families. And he put me in that family. I had a family. The one sister in that, in that family calls me her double sister because I am a part of her family. In fact, when mom passed away, I was every bit as much her daughter as any of those other children that she gave birth to. But why the devil, sister? Partly because I'm in her family and partly because we both are in the family of God. She literally prayed me into the kingdom of God. If you are praying for someone that you want to receive Jesus, receive salvation, don't give up. No matter how long it takes, do not give up. Continue to pray because God is at work. Our God is faithful. He's at work behind the scenes. And he will answer those prayers. Mother's Day is hard. I can't go to the store. I can't go to the store and, and buy a Mother's Day card. That one time when I went for all of those, I was trying to find just the right card that said just exactly what I wanted that mama to know that I felt about her. And I can't do that now. I can't call them up and talk to them. I can't take them out for lunch. I can't go and have coffee with them. But what I can have is I can have hope that I will one day again see each one of those because they love Jesus. And that's the hope that we have when someone, we lose somebody close to us and they know Jesus. Our hope is that we will see them again. And each one of those women impacted my life in so many different ways. The woman I am today some of that is because of who they were in my life, and I am so grateful for them, so incredibly grateful. One of the things that I learned from them was trust. When you grow up in a foster home, you don't necessarily trust, but they encouraged me to trust God. God continues to work that in me, to trust him because it's something that we all need to do. And there are times when I just want to be in control. I just want to fix things. My kids go through stuff, and I want to fix it and, and take care of it. My granddaughter has to have a new heart and a new kidney, and I want to get in there and somehow fix it. There's absolutely nothing that I can do. It's been an incredible roller coaster with her, with, there's been a few times since that happened that we don't even know if she's gonna live. She had to have a pacemaker put in for this brand new heart. And it's just like, God, I can't control anything. And he just says, I'm in control. I am in control. You know, so often, I think moms, parents, you know what, actually just people. People want to control things. We want to fix things. We often hear that it's the guys that want to fix things, and the women just want to be able to share their emotions. Well, let me tell you, I want to fix things and I want to share my emotions both. <laughs> and I think that's true with a whole lot of us. But we can't fix things. There are certain things that God would have us do, but overall, he is in control, we are not. 
As Pastor so often says, he is God and I am not. And we have to learn to trust God. Scripture tells us to trust in the Lord with all your heart. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Not just part of it, but all of it. And when you're not trusting with all of it, the Holy Spirit is faithful to tap you on the shoulder and say, trust, trust, stop worrying. As we heard this morning, stop, cast your anxieties on him and trust. Lean not on your own understanding. Don't depend on your own understanding. There are so many situations in life where my heart and my mind are not going to understand. But I can trust. I can trust that my Heavenly Father has a plan. And that's true for each and every one of you. You go through things that, that don't make sense and you don't understand. And your heart and your mind cry out, God, help me to understand. And he says, trust, trust. In all our ways, everything, submit to him. When I asked Austin to come up with this scripture for me today, I said, I don't really care what translation you use because I'm going to kind of ad lib part of it anyway. So what does he do? He comes up with the word submit. You know, um, I was not expecting that. I was expecting acknowledge, but the word submit. And really what that means is we just give it to God. We give it to God because we cannot do it ourselves, but God can. And he will make our paths straight. He will straighten out the kinks that are in the road and line things up the way he wants it done. Maybe not the, exactly the way we want it, but he will line it up. And you might be listening to us today. You might have heard Pastor Vicki share. You might have heard Tawny share. And you're thinking, and you may have been hearing what I'm saying, and you may be thinking, I don't have that kind of relationship with God. I don't know that God that you're talking about. I don't know how to trust him. I want to, but I don't know how. And if you are in the sound of my voice today, whether in this room, on live stream, or whether you're hearing at another time, you can have that relationship with God. That is what he wants. That is why he sent Jesus. And all you have to do is acknowledge that Jesus is the Son of God. He came to earth. He lived a sinless life. He died on the cross to forgive our sin, past, present, future. All sin, yours, mine, the people out there, sin is forgiven. There's nothing that we can do to make it any different. Jesus did it all. When he said it is finished, when he hung on the cross, it was finished. What was finished was what he needed to do to enable us to have a relationship, to be brought back into God's family. And that invitation is open to each and every person. Come into his family. Believe that Jesus loves you. Believe that he wants you to be part of his family. Confess that you want to be, that you need Jesus. So often we go our own way, we just do our own thing with no thought about God. But when we submit our ways to him, when we become part of his family, he welcomes us with open arms. And his arms are open for each and every one of you. And as I pray in closing, I invite you to think about what God has been saying to your heart today. Through something that Tawny said, through something that Vicki said, through something that you heard me say, through a song, through pastor's prayer, God is faithful, he speaks to our hearts. And I can say that I know for sure, because my God is faithful, that he has spoken 
to your heart. Tune in to what he's saying to you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for loving us. Thank you so much for opening your heart, opening your arms, forgiving us, drawing us into your family. No matter what we have gone through, no matter what we've done, you love us. And you call us and you draw us close to you. I thank you for that. Minister, Lord God, to each person today where you want to minister to them in Jesus' name and always, always for your glory. Amen. Thanks for watching this message with me. If you want to see more, make sure you hit that subscribe button and bell to be notified when we go live or post a new video. We'd also like to invite you to join us at a live service here at Desert Grace. For more information, visit desertgrace.org or give us a call at 928-305-1132 for more information. Thank you.